In this video we're going to review the bones and the surface markings of the shoulder, the arm, and the hand. So what you're looking at with this picture is you're looking at an anterior view. So just to get your get, get straightened out what you're looking at, here's your sternum, there's your manubrium, there's your jugular notch, we have the costal cartilage, and we have the rib cage. This bone up here, commonly called your collarbone, but you're not going to call it that, is the clavicle. Okay, as a clavicle, you'll see it articulates with this bone posteriorly, which is the scapula, which I will show you a different view of. The one part surface marking of the scapula that you can see here is the glenoid cavity. And you'll notice this is where the humerus, which is this bone, is going to articulate. Notice the glenoid cavity isn't very deep. So your shoulder is one of your most flexible or mobile joints, but it's also one of your most unstable joints. And one of the reasons are unstable joints. The reason it is, is because this glenoid cavity isn't very deep. And so there's not a lot. That head of the humerus doesn't go deep into a socket, and so it makes it more unstable. So let's look more specifically at the humerus. The, the head of the humerus is right here. You need to know the head of the humerus is medial. With some of these bones, especially on the arm and leg, you're going to have to be able to orient them correctly. So when you pick them up, you can figure out what's medial, what's lateral, what's anterior, what's posterior. And that will help you. Uh, you're more likely to correctly identify the parts if you can do that. So the head of the humerus is medial. On the lateral side of the humerus is what's called the greater tubercle. So when you find the head, which is medial, you go lateral and you have the greater tubercle. And then in the anterior portion of the humerus, you have the lesser tubercle. So again, it's going to help you if you remember head is medial, greater tubercle is lateral, and then the lesser tubercle is anterior. These bumps, these tubercles, are where muscles are going to attach. And if you put your hand straight down in the side of your body, you can actually feel, you can feel that greater tubercle. And if you rotate your rotate your arm, you can feel that greater tubercle go in and out, or you can feel it leave and, and touch your fingers. So again, real quickly, this is the clavicle. This is the scapula, which I'll show you a better picture of in a second. This is the glenoid cavity, where the head of the humerus is going to articulate. Greater tubercle is on the lateral side. Lesser tubercle is anterior. And again, obviously, this is the humerus. Now we're going to look at the scapula from a posterior view. So if you were standing behind a person and you could see through them, this would be the scapula. This is the glenoid cavity that I discussed in the previous slide. So this is where the head of the humerus would articulate. And this is the spine of the scapula. And you can feel this. If you put your fingers on your back, on your upper back, you can follow that spine of the scapula all the way up. So again, this is the scapula, this is the glenoid cavity, and this is the spine of the scapula. Now we're going to look at the distal posterior view of the humerus. So we're down towards your elbow, we're down towards your elbow, and we're posterior. The way you can tell the posterior aspect of the humerus is it has a deep indentation. The front of the humerus, the anterior portion, has a indentation, but the one that's posterior is the deepest, and that is called the olecranon fossa. Okay, that is called the olecranon fossa. Then we have what are called epicondyles. When we went through the skull, I mentioned the occipital condyles and their smooth surfaces. Epicondyles, epi meaning on top, epicondyles are above, are above the condyles. Now this is the medial epicondyle. Notice how much more significant it is than the lateral epicondyle. So you just need to know condyles, okay? You just need to know condyles for the test. But it may help you that this is medial. This medial epicondyle is much bigger. And if we went it straight up, we would run into that head of the humerus. So that can help you orient the humerus correctly. And then here is our smooth surfaces, and that those are the epic. Oh, sorry, those are the condyles. So epicondyles are above the condyles, okay, above the condyles. In reality, if you guys go on to AMP 1 and 2 or take a two semester sequence, these condyles have specific names, but for our sake we're just going to go with condyles. So we have epicondyles here and here, we have the olecranon fossa right here, and then we have condyles. Now let's look at the lower arm. Okay, the lower arm you have two bones, you have the radius and the ulna. 
this right here is the radius. Now the radius will be lateral and remember we're always in the anatomical position so it's going to be on the thumb side as you're standing in the anatomical position. Position. This is going to be important that you know that the radius is on the lateral side because when we talk about arteries and taking a person's pulse you're going to use the radial artery and so you need to make sure you put your fingers on the lateral side. The parts of the radius that you need to know here is the proximal portion. This is called the head of the radius, so nearest the elbow. Down at the end you have this little pointy part you can actually feel it if you go on the thumb side of your arm but right by the wrist you can feel this styloid process of the radius. Now the medial bone, the medial bone of the lower arm is called the ulna. One way you can distinguish them, ulna starts with U and you've got this U-shaped structure at the proximal end of the ulna. Now, unfortunately, this isn't called the U, but what it is called, it's called the trochlear notch. Okay, it's called the trochlear notch. This is what's going to fit into the humerus and form what you typically think of as your elbow. Down here, just like on the radius, we have another styloid process. Again, you can feel that if you go on your pinky side and you find your wrist, you can find that styloid process of the ulna. So here we have the radius, which is lateral the head and the styloid process. Here we have the ulna, which is medial. You have the trochlear notch, which will articulate with the humerus. And then you also have the styloid process of the ulna. Now, here's an anterior view of the hand. This is the thumb side. Okay, so you got to think about, all right, what bone is on that thumb side? That will be lateral in the anatomical position. And that bone is going to be the radius. Here we are on the medial side and you have the ulna. You can see the styloid process of the ulna and you can kind of see the styloid process of the radius there. The bones down here, which you think of as your wrist, which articulate with the radius and the ulna, are called the carpals. Bones here, which make up primarily what you think of as the palm of your hand, those are the metacarpals. And then the finger bones are the phalanges. One way to remember you're going to see tarsals when we get to the toes. Carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay. There's a lot of a nerve that runs through here and lots of ligaments and lots of mostly tendons that run through here. There's a tunnel here and it's covered by some tissue and so when you do repetitive like typing and you're bending your wrist a lot that nerve can get irritated so you get carpal tunnel in through here. So again ulna, radius, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. Again, review all these parts, take the practice test, and work your, work your way through the worksheets.